Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Indie Eleven Podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Griffiths, and this is the show where we bring on those from the world of football to show you what it takes to be in the Eleven at the highest possible level. Feels good to say that again. It's been a little while. There's a lot to come uh, in an update episode for me that's dropping shortly, um, and even these episodes that are that are coming now, uh, I've had them, <coughs> excuse me, recorded for a little while. And just craziness with, you know, stuff going on in the background, sicknesses and injuries and just a whole lot of stuff that is not important right now because we have a very special guest on the show today and I can't wait to share with you his story. You may know him as a professional footballer, the Flower City Union or Salt City Union. You may also know him as one of the up and coming content creators on YouTube, on Instagram, Noah Cavanaugh is in the 11 today, and we share his story of his football career. We also talk a little bit about what's it like, you know, posting on YouTube, posting on Instagram, being an athlete and a content creator and an entrepreneur at the same time. Um, so it's really an exciting one. I had a lot of fun, and uh, I hope that you guys are going to learn a lot too from Noah's story. So I don't want to take up any more of your time here at the beginning. I'll kick it over to myself and Noah. Stepping into the 11 now this week and joining us is Noah Cavanaugh. First and foremost, Noah, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of, uh, as you just mentioned, a busy a busy schedule, a busy week. Um, I'm sure it's never easy kind of when you're in off season. Sometimes you feel like you get to relax, but then somehow it becomes even more busy than when you're actually in the season. So I appreciate it. Exactly. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, so if we, uh, before we kind of get into all the exciting stuff that I'm looking forward to talking to you about, you know, your football career, kind of the stuff you have on your social medias as well, your online presence, if we kind of paint the picture here for the listeners growing up in the Pacific Northwest was football kind of a love at first sight. Was it, uh, you know, one of the things that just, you couldn't stay away from as a, as a young player. Definitely. I, my parents were, I feel lucky that my parents forced me to play three sports until I was a freshman in high school. So until I was 14, I was basically forced to do whichever you want to do, but you have to play three or do three kind of physical activities. So at the very end of that was basketball, swim team and soccer. Soccer obviously was the priority. I was playing soccer 24 uh, seven, but I did have to participate in those other sports uh, up until high school. And then it was, and then it was free range. So it's been football ever since. Yeah. So would that be kind of the same recommendation you would give to whether it's parents asking you or kids asking you and, you know, maybe they're younger than that and they say, hey, I just want to focus on one sport. Would you kind of push them the opposite way towards, no, keep, you know, being active and athletic in a lot of different, in the different uh, sports? I think it's going to depend on the kid. I think some kids are going to be more prone to focusing on that one thing. Some kids are going to maybe need those extra kind of different things to help them focus in, in different ways. And so for me, I don't think there's like a one size fits all part of me wishes I could have played football solely from the time that I was five until now, because it probably would have exponentially increased my chances of playing at a much higher level. That being said, I, I don't regret any of it. I mean, it just, it is what it is. And so for me, I think it's, it's just kind of up to the parents at the end of the day. It's like, you do what you think is best and I'm sure the kid will turn out just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was part of that maybe, you know, secret, like wanting to play football from that young age. Was it because kind of early on, you knew that you, this was a, you know, a goal you had for yourself to be a professional or to play at a super high level, or when did you kind of materialize this dream that you've had? I think it started when I was about 10 or 11. Football for me started to become sort of an expression of self, an expression almost of art in a sense. And we can dive into this later, some mindset stuff that I've gotten into recently, but sort of one of the big things that I kind of come back to is creating my own masterpiece on the field. And for me, that sort of has always been the way that I think about football as an art, football as an expression form. And so I'd say 10 or 11 years old, I really started to think, hey, being a pro footballer would be sick. That would be so much yeah. fun. 
<laughs> yeah. And, and so as you're kind of going up and maybe then you go into high school and now it's, all right, I'm going to focus on this a little bit more solely. Was the, you know, was the plans that you're starting to formulate with yourself? Was it always college soccer? Was it maybe I can see if I can do this before? And I always like to ask this question because I think, you know, even from now to maybe like when you were having that discussion with yourself at that time, the soccer landscape in U.S. has kind of reconfigured itself multiple different times, right? So what was it kind of like for you, um, totally. you know, in school, just figuring out your soccer plan? Absolutely. So I was never a player who got looked at from a young age. So for me, it was sort of always coming from the B team at a club level to then moving into the A team, training with the development academy when we did have that later on college was always going to happen no matter what because of how my parents felt about it they felt that even if you're going to pursue this professional soccer gig you have to have a college education first and right wrong or indifferent it's you know no harm no foul i don't feel any type of way about it i had a blast in college it was for all intents and purposes it was basically playing as a professional yes i had to go to class i had to study but the facilities that we had in college are far and away above most things that i even have now as a professional other than my own equipment teams don't have that sort of money they don't so they don't have that sort of facilities they don't have that sort of support when you get injured or when you do that those kind of things that you know maybe are unfortunate parts of your career in some aspects and so for me it was a matter of taking advantage of what i knew that i had to do and my you know my parents said hey you have to get a college degree so i said okay i've got 4 years to one develop into the best footballer i possibly can and two i get to enjoy these essentially premier league level facilities basically for lack of a better yeah. term because there was a lot of money in college soccer and so for me that was it was just about taking advantage of it uh, i went to a really small college which we can get into as well but and that experience was amazing so i just went basically club college and then it was into the professional game from there yeah no but you bring up a really good point there and it's something that i've addressed with you know other players on the podcast before and i'm sure i've spoken to it um, that it is something that I think players struggle with when they maybe go from college to like that first pro contract, if it's not, you know, MLS or if it's not super high level, right? Because all of a sudden they're in fourth division in Sweden and they're like, wait a second, this doesn't look like pro. Like there's, there's no physio here. There's no, there's nothing. Yeah. Right. But you know, it's that mindset of thinking totally. like, okay, all that money in college that was going towards the beautiful pitch, the facility, the athletic training staff, all of these things, now that's being written in a check and giving to you as a pro player. So it's like, you gotta kind of pick at certain levels, which one you want. It's like, yeah, you can have all those facilities and everything, right. but yeah. you're gonna be the one forking the bill over for that one. For sure, for sure. So yeah, that's a good, did, that's a really good point. I hadn't really thought of it that way, but yeah. Yeah. So you decide to go to Whitman. What's the kind of thought process behind that? Were there some other schools interested or maybe talk to me about your recruiting process? Definitely. So mine was kind of all over the place. If I'm honest, the, by the time I was 15, I believe. So sophomore year in high school, our club team was going to surf cup. We were going to showcase games. We were going to play teams in different States. And so that allowed me to express myself in a way that was a little bit easier, I think, than maybe some other non-development Academy players at the time, I guess that's what it would have been called. Uh, non DA players. That was the best way we could get into getting seen by college coaches and so it was either that or you go straight up to a id camp i think that was what they were called when i was there it's been a little while so they might be called something else but id camp for lack of a better term basically just a tryout and so it was one of those two options was basically big tournament where college coaches are going to be your id camp and so i went to a few different ones one on the one big one called the elite 300 at University of Pennsylvania, uh, Swarthmore, University of Pennsylvania okay. hosted it, but it was at Swarthmore College over in Pennsylvania. And that was 10 colleges, I believe, my sophomore year in high school and kids from all over the world uh, came to that, went to a few ID camps on 
the West Coast as well, a couple in California, Seattle University, University of Washington. I never actually went to the Whitman one, but the Whitman coach saw me play at a US. DA tournament, I believe it was called, or WCBA, which is like the West Coast. It was like a West Coast Champions League, essentially. So it was all the state finalists and all this stuff. And so I had to talk to several different coaches. There was a couple, SU, Seattle University had started recruiting me a little bit. We, I had a couple colleges, small colleges from the East Coast, a couple in California as well. And Whitman, to me stood out because of one particular story. And I think this is something that I always tell people when they're asking about college, because I think it's really important to choose a college. If you're for sure going to go to graduate, it's one thing if you're going to play at a division one school, you're like, okay, I just need to get development years so that I can jump to college or jump to pro. I don't need a college degree. Fair enough. For somebody like myself who had to, you know, had to get a college degree from my parents or, you know, if that's your commitment, I would say pick a school because you like being there. If you have the ability and the means, pick a school because you like being there. One, my older cousin had a full ride to Harvard. She was an absolute baller back in, I think she graduated from college in 2009 or 10 maybe. So this was you know quite a bit earlier than me. That coach, six months before she went there, went to... University UPenn and UPenn obviously is not you know a great college athletic program but it's not Harvard and so the coach moves over and goes hey I can offer you a full ride at UPenn she goes to UPenn tears her ACL her junior year absolutely hates the school and she was like it was miserable for an entire year and I said okay from from that advice I'm only going to choose a school yes based on soccer program great but I have to love it there Lo and behold, I had a double hernia surgery before my junior year, was out the entire junior year, but had no issues because I loved the location. I loved the people. I loved the school. I loved what I was studying. And so that's what I always tell people is, for me, it's it, it was a matter of, okay, find a way to get to a place that you enjoy being. And then you can make the most out of what that environment will offer you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you bring a really important point that... I sometimes feel like it's hard for, you know, there's lots of different companies out there or people that advise, you know, kind of college soccer consulting services, right? Or helping kids kind of get to that next level. And I think if you do it on an individualized level, that's great. But like you just spoke to there, there's really no one size fits all advice you can give to, hey, kids, this is what you should do when looking for college, right? Because there's some kids that I would advise that that's the perfect advice. But as you mentioned along there too, like, there's some kids that are like, I just want to get in, get out as quick as possible because I'm trying to go pro. Um, and there's some kids that, you know, totally. maybe it's like you would advise them to think about where a coach is going to be the best fit for them. But as you spoke to there, like coaches leave, coaches get new jobs, coaches do other things. So there's so many different factors. And I think that kind of is a nice North Star maybe to have is like, all right, this is a school that I like. It's an area that I like, and regardless if everything goes to goes downhill with football, then, all right, I still have uh, these other factors that I can kind of rely on. But I imagine for you, the football is also a really mm-hmm. nice piece to have as well. Definitely. Yeah, it was, it was spectacular. Nice. And so, like... I guess from the the professional side of it or that aspect of maybe still kind of having that as your goal in the back of your mind when you're in college, do you think the division part of it, right? One, going division one, two or three or NAIA, like how do you kind of think that affects maybe your chances of going pro or, or how do you see that playing out as a player like yourself who's done it from division three, but I'm sure you've met players who have done it from all, all levels. Definitely. I think straight out of college, there is absolutely a stigma, right, wrong, or indifferent in the world of American football from the MLS, USL Championship, USL 1. It's very unlikely that a Division 3 player is going to jump into the professional game straight out of college from a D3 or an NAI level. That's just kind of the way it is. Maybe that player is just as good as a Division 1 player, but unfortunately, college coaches, or excuse me, pro coaches in America tend to be more geared towards that division one player, right, wrong, or indifferent. 
I do think though that as I was coming up, the draft was different when I was coming out of college. I think the draft now is sort of because they have MLS next pro and that's sort of a feeder league. And now they've got these, you know, Seattle Sounders two team that's Tacoma defiance, but they're an MLS. Now. It's, it's all, it's all yeah. over the place. Now I think the draft isn't what it used to be. So I think actually you definitely, as long as you can ball out in D3, I think there's absolutely a road for you to get into a very high level professional game. And with NISA now, the National Independent Soccer Association, along with that, all in that third division, I think now it's totally possible. Because when I was coming out of college, it was like, if you're not in the M- when you get to the MLS draft, that means you're getting drafted into an MLS next T or MLS team. Yeah. Whereas now if you like, half those draftees. I mean, I just look at, for instance, a group of guys that I played with in the summertime who were at UW, a, I think six of them got dra- drafted into the MLS. Only two of them out of those six actually play for the first team. The rest of them are captaining or on the second team or MLS next pro teams yeah. of those MLS squads. And that's fantastic is what I'm saying is like, that's such a cool thing for those young players because they can jump straight into that professional environment as opposed to it being, it's either MLS or your SOL. And so that's kind of where for me, it's like the landscape has changed so much. And to be able to be an older pro who's been in the game for now five or six, I think this is like my sixth year now or something like that it's so cool to be able to help those younger players along and say, dude, you're 22. You think you're old. You have so much time to continue to improve, to continue to build. Like there, there are now so many growing opportunities in, in the U S that I think are super exciting for lots of players. And so I would always encourage guys to be positive and to be, and to be really, really intentional with the way they just attack it as much as they can. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's definitely something that is so unique and and cool about the United States is that like in Germany, once you're a 22 or 23 year old player, they're kind of like, you haven't made it yet. Like, what do you do? Why are you still doing this? Right? Like that's so for them, it's like so far, you're so far past it. Right. Whereas like in the States, we just have a different mindset about it. Um, But I wanted to ask you as well, like, was that ever something you felt like was kind of a bit of a challenge in, it's hard enough to become a pro, right? But then also it seems like every year kind of the lands, like you said, the landscape is changing. There's new leagues, there's new teams, there's new, just a new way to kind of get to the top. Did that ever feel kind of difficult to navigate that as well as navigating your own career? Yeah, definitely. I would say particularly in the United States with all the change, changing landscapes, part of that could have been why even subconsciously I decided to go abroad straight away. So for me, it was like, okay, given when I'm coming out of the college, what the landscape looks like, okay, cool. There aren't going to be that many opportunities for a division three player, despite having won awards, done all region T, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like any of those awards really don't matter if you're a D3 player. So that's cool that, you know, pat on the back, yeehaw. But like at the end of the day, it didn't really matter as far as getting recruited into the pro game. So I said, okay, cool. What are, what's the next best option? I can move into the pro game in another country, or I can go to, I went to Spain. I played in Denmark. I went to Australia, like all of these places. And you start to build that resume so that when you come back to the U S and Ooh, it's been a year and a half. And all of a sudden, NISA pops up out of nowhere. MLS Next pops up out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, okay, cool. We have pro level that have great facilities, decent pay, and it's it's there for you. And so it's like, okay, all I had to do was just to continue to grind in an environment that, yeah, sure, might have been really uncomfortable. We might have gone through crazy stuff over in, you know, over in Spain or down in Australia or whatever. But all of that was to prepare for these moments where I'm now, where I'm in an apartment in Rochester, New York, totally signed, done deal, ready to go. My wife's here with me. Everything's great. Season's going well. You know, so, you know, going from point A to point Z might take yes. a lot of zigzags. But at the end of the day, it's it's just kind of like you have to be creative and have to be willing to push through that several different barriers in order to get to where you want to be eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, that's the, that's the thing I think I'm, I'm always curious about for a player like yourself, right? Where 
you graduate, you know, you walk across that stage, you get that degree, and you know you have this dream of becoming a professional player. And I think a lot of players have that same dream. But I know, like, for me a little bit, and I know for a lot of players out there, is they have that dream, and then they kind of look out at the landscape. And it's even similar to, you know, if you want to go and just get a regular job, right? A lot of people, I think, look at it and are like, how do I even do this? What's my next step? Like, for you, what was... What was the plan of attack? What was like, all right, I've got the degree. I'm done with college. How am I going to go and do this? Yeah. So as soon as I, as soon as we went through the end of season in December ish, November, December on my last season at Whitman, I still had six months till I was graduating. So I said, okay, there's a couple things. It's, it's that old saying of like, I am the master of everything I can control. Right. And nothing else. So I can train my ass off. I can get really, really good. I can improve. I can continue to build on the momentum I had in season. I can talk to my college coach because he's got a bunch of connections. That's a lot of people are too afraid to say, oh, well, maybe I didn't perform as well my senior year. I feel like I can't ask the coach. No, you have dreams. They're here to help you. Like that's, <laughs> that's, such, a, that's such a weird misnomer when people are like, I don't want to ask for help. It's like, you're not you going to get to. anywhere if yes. you don't ask for help. That's the whole point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have to. And so I think for for me, it was like, how can I put my fingers into as many people's ears? I know that's kind of a weird visual, but like yeah. as many, you know, how, how can I call as many people? How can I talk to as many people? I had a phone call with uh, Joe Funicello from Soccer Visa, like before he even went to Costa Rica, because I wanted his opinion on my situation. I talked to guys in England. I talked to guys in Spain. I talked to old friends and friends of mine. W one of the other things that I think I would recommend is most soccer players, especially, or most footballers in college have guys ahead of them, whether it's club players they know, other college students or players they know. All of those guys have their own networks. So if anyone above you in age is two years ahead of you, that's the perfect person because they're even one step, even a person who's one step ahead of you, there you go. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's one step closer to where you're going to get. And so for me, it was like, okay, how do I attack all these options? Sure, you graduate, you get good grades, whatever. You know, At the end of the day, I was like, okay, this isn't going to take me to where I want to be, but I got to do it. So in between all those, it was train, it was network like a crazy person, and it was make sure that I have some semblance of a plan of attack. And by the time I graduated, three weeks after I got my diploma in my hand, I was on a plane off to Spain. And that was like, okay, this is it. Here we go. Yeah. Man, it's it's the perfect advice. Like it's, And I think, you know, I can even just share kind of some personal context to this. Like when I first reached out even to you, right, about doing this podcast, or it kind of started with asking you questions about you know, my kind of situation. And I think, and in the beginning of my career, I was probably in a mindset where I was afraid to do things like that. But as I went forward, I kind of realized one, like we said, you have to do that. Because the reality of football is that there are still going to be gatekeepers at all levels. So you need to kind of have people that are going to let you pass those gates to be able to get to your next step. But also, I think about it from the perspective of me, like, you know, nine times out of 10, if you are a player and you reach out to me and, you know, you're respectful about it and you ask me for help, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the best that I can. You know, I might not exactly give you something on a silver platter, but I might give you some sort of information that can help you get to your next step. And everybody, you know, says the idea of like, oh, I don't really have connections. I don't have a network. If you've played on a team before, you have connections. You reach out to the coach that was your coach for your club or your college or your high school or former teammates and say, even if they don't specifically know someone, they might know someone who knows someone who knows someone, right? And I think people have a, a misconception totally. that it's like, well, I don't know the sporting director of any clubs or I don't know the president of any clubs. It's like, you don't now, but if you start to put in the seeds, eventually maybe you can make connections like that. And they're so important to be able to kind of foster a career. Mm hmm. 100%. So Spain is the first, uh, is the first stop on the, on the world tour where, uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. So Spain, I guess. I had a stint in Denmark. Oh, let's let's talk about this actually really quick. So Denmark happened yeah. my junior year of college. So okay. we're going to back up just a tiny bit. 
for those of you who are in college in America, because you, for the most part, as far as I'm concerned, study abroad programs, most, if not all scholarships and any money that the school gives you, I believe you can still travel abroad and like study abroad if they accept you. Meaning you can go abroad even if like, and not pay any extra, you know, so to speak for like an extra program or something. What that meant for me is, ooh, I can pick a location where I know I can go play semi-pro or even professional on the college's dime. And I can get a season or a season in, you know, half a season even at that level on the off season. So I, I went fall junior year, had, I had an injury and this actually worked out perfectly. So I had an injury rehabbed until I played in the last game of my junior year for, for the, for that season, trained a bunch over December, jumped straight into five different preseason camps with Danish teams in Copenhagen, got offered spots at a bunch of them, basically had my pick of the lot while I was under student visa and then I was just able to play for an entire season. And it was like, it, it was kind of a cheat code. Cause then I came back and I was like, yeah, I've had European football under my belt now. You know, that's like, that's such a cool thing. And that's like an extra, that's like an extra little kind of thing you can yeah. do if, if that's something that you're interested in, if you're committed to staying in college and whatever. Um, so that was, that was awesome. Spain though, was my first like full-time football. I'm doing this a hundred percent. Uh, and, and that was a really tough situation. We were brought over, uh, for, for a lack of a, to make a long story short, we were brought over by somebody who wasn't prepared to have us in the country. And so there was no, there, there was promising X, Y, and Z. And we got like about that much percentage of it. So I got signed for a club and had to leave after 90 days because the club couldn't do the visa situation and yep. the agent who had brought me over had basically said, yeah, I've done my job. See you later. And I was like, well, that doesn't help. So there was a whole lot of emotional roller coaster in that situation, which was, it was a lot. It was, it was a crazy experience. And out of the six guys I was over there with, the only two dudes that are still playing are me and my best friend. And the others after that three months quit soccer period done end of story. And there's so many, so many stories of guys like that who get to their first roadblock. As I was talking about before, they get to their first roadblock and all of a sudden, Oh, there's a roadblock gatekeeper. Okay. See ya. I'm done. Right. You have to push through that. You have to say, okay, what's my, why the, why is not the, the, why is not to look on my phone and see a uh, pro footballer in my Instagram thing. That's yeah. not the point. The point is to yeah. play football for a living because I love what I do. That's it's process focused. It's not results driven. Yeah, man. I, I absolutely love that you talk about it. And, and just a, a quick sidebar. I completely agree on the student visa part of it. I've heard some players that have done kind of the same thing and it might be something for those who have the financial means. It's like, if you know, you want to do it, maybe go and get your bachelor's degree or something or go and get your master's degree, pick a country where you can, you know, do it. And then boom now, cause like, as you just laid out in that story right after it, what was the, the one or not the one, but one of the huge factors that led Spain to kind of crumbling the visa process, right? Like people don't realize that going to Europe, it's not just about, can you get on a team or can you find a, a team to play for? To be honest, you can find a hundred teams to play for, but it's a matter of, can you stay there? in the country legally right. <laughs> and, you know, not get your ass kicked out. Yeah. Um, but I love that you talk about that, that, that first roadblock, that first adversity, because I think it's so critical and that, you know, you're definitely not alone in feeling that any player, even at the highest of levels has had a moment very early on in your career where you get tested and you kind of are asked, you know, point blank, Hey, is this for you or is it not for you? Um, did that kind of feel like a moment mm -hmm. for you in Spain where you were just sort of being asked that question? Like, Hey, is this a road you still want to keep going down? Or, you know, do you maybe want to look for something a little, a little less, uh, bumpy? For me, it was always, as much as I struggled with it at certain moments, for me, it was always a, it was a process thing. So for me, it was never really an issue and mm -hmm. I, 
maybe I'm one in a million, maybe I'm one of everyone who feels this way, but I do, I did find that my why was strong enough that that never crossed my mind. I was never like, oh, I'm done playing football. I was just yeah. like, I'm going to find a way to make this work and it's going to happen. And you spoke a little bit before about like the psychology of football. How do you, how have you kind of built that mindset for yourself? Like, I know a lot of players struggle with that when they face adversity or, you know, they face difficult times in their career. Like, how have you kind of built that bulletproof mentality to, you know, cause I'm sure even post that experience, you know, I know you've had injuries. I know you've had other things that have made it difficult for your career to kind of go smoothly. Like how have you built that, you know, bulletproof mindset, so to speak? I think it's a combination of, one, having the right mentors around me. Oftentimes when you're trying to break through roadblocks or you're trying to accomplish something in life, it's not often, the hardest question to answer is not often how or what, it's who. And who is always the question that I like to ask. It's who's going to help me. And this goes back to our networking, you know, sort, sort of our networking earlier. It's like, it's not how I'm going to get there. Cause I can work just as hard as everyone else, if not harder, what I have my, why I've got my, what the, what is playing pro, but it's the who, because as you said before, there are certain, you know, gatekeepers, whether it be government, right. With the visa situation or whether it be a coach or an agent who says, nah, you're crap, get out of here. We don't want you. Mm-hmm. Whatever the, whatever the who may be, that's often the most important question. And so for me, it's about surrounding yourself with people who are of that same mindset, of that same blood, of that same attitude, doing as much as you possibly can on the end of do your own research. YouTube and Google is our free platforms. It's crazy how much information there is about sports psychology in general. And then I've also married that with one of the probably one of the best investments I've ever made in my entire career is hiring a sports psychologist. So I work with somebody every week, one-on-one, even for like 10 minutes. And so for me, that is like all those things kind of put together creates this ability to get through those adverse moments really, really quickly. Yeah. I'm I'm really happy that you spoke to the sports psychology part of it and maybe sometimes even not outsourcing it, right? But using other resources to kind of help you along in that process. I think it's so much, it's getting better. Um, and I, but I still think, do you feel this as well? Like there still sometimes seems to be a little bit of a, just a stigma around kind of speaking about the game from the mental health side of it, or just the, you know, mental performance side of it. Um, or is that kind of narrative starting to shift in as more players like yourself and, and players from all over the world speak to, yeah, I utilize someone almost the same way I would a fitness coach or, a, you know, a strength and conditioning coach to kind of make my mind stronger. I think it's absolutely becoming more prevalent in a lot of spaces. I wish it were even more, and I know it will be hopefully more popular as time goes on, just in the same way we saw MLS Next Pro and all these other physical leagues pop up, we'll see a lot more sports psychology and we'll start to see the rhetoric change around that stuff. And to be honest, for me, therapy in college was actually, or counseling therapy, whatever you want to call it, was free in college. And so I even went to the counseling office or the therapy office once a week just to get my mind straight about where my goals were at and where my college teammates' goals were at. Because even in even back in college, you think about you have guys who college is their peak. It's their pinnacle. Yeah. It's the best football they'll ever play in their life. And that's beautiful. That's a great thing. It's it, it's what feeds them. It's what makes them happy. And they know that they're going to give it their all for four years and then they're done. But I was here. I was like way. And, and, and I just mean this as far as not above them, not better than them. I just had simply be- different goals. I had different yeah. goals than they did. And so for me, it was like okay, I have access to this free therapy. Why not go honestly work through like relationship issues with ex-girlfriends and, you know, dumb crap like that. But also how can I keep my mind switched on for the performance aspect? Cause I don't just want to work through crap. I want to, I want to, I want to make sure that my life is optimized in the best way I possibly can. 
And so you take all of that work over the literally weekly for four years. So you take all that compounding. Then after college, a couple years of on my own doing stuff, then you hire a sports psychologist. And it's like, I'm happy to talk about it any time because I know that other kids are in my spot being like, I'm so down. I've gone through this roadblock. How do I get my confidence? Uh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's like, man, watch a YouTube video, watch a Ted talk, learn, apply it to your life. See what works, see what doesn't. If you have zero money in all of the world, but you have internet access, the best way is to go on YouTube, type in sports psychology and watch every single video and just write down what hits home for you. Yeah. And then from there, it's like, okay, now I've got some things I can start to do, whether it's journaling every day, whether it's, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever works for you, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, the practice isn't what matters. It's just that process of like, how do I build my m mindset so that when stuff comes in, when I go in trial and I go trial after trial after trial, I spend money getting to places and everyone says no. What's yeah. the thing that matters most to me? Okay, my why? Okay, cool. Now let's roll. And so for me, it's always been like, I, I would I would say that's probably, I'm glad we spoke about this because for me, that's probably one of my biggest pushes for young players is find find the elite mindset and everything else will start to work out. Yeah. I think it's so important because I think from one, I can also maybe speak to like, you know, even players who I've spoken to on here who, um, you know, like play at the levels that you're at, play at levels in Europe, like players that you would almost think that, oh, they've, they've made it right. They're professionals. Like this is what they do that, that maybe a younger player would look at them and think they've got it figured out, right. They go play professionally, like they're living the dream. And I think it would be surprising for a lot of people to know, maybe ones that work with psychologists, maybe ones that haven't yet added that as part of their regiment, like what kind of the internal dialect or dialogue is of a player, maybe on a, on a mm -hmm. pitch when they start to make mistakes or even, you know, off the field when it's the careers kind of going a bit rocky. Like, I think people would be really shocked to know, like sometimes what's going on in between the ears for certain players out there. And that's why sports psychology becomes so critical and it's something that I've utilized as well. And, and I kind of look at it as like the same way when you're, you know, training to become a footballer, you have all these kind of tools that you're trying to add into your, your arsenal, right? Like, can you play this pass? Can you play that pass? Can you shoot? It's like, you got to build those same kind of tools for when adversity strikes and when it hits you, like, all right, I've just been told no by a club, like, but I've had this happen before. I can recognize the signs. I can recognize the emotions I'm feeling. And now I know, all right, I'm going to apply this. I'm going to apply patience or I'm going to, whatever it may be, whatever you work on with your psychologist or that you've learned through the, you know, kind of self-taught way. Um, it becomes so, so important. So I'm happy that you spoke to it as well. Cause I think it, it becomes just as important, if not more than the physical side. Like a lot of players would probably argue the mental component of the game is maybe more than, you know, the physical side. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think at some point too, you know, I'm, perhaps you can speak to this in your own career as well, but I think for myself, it's like, yes, I've made absolutely incremental improvements in my skill and my fitness and my ability to prepare off the field and on the field physically, but the mental, the, the differences in my play, those skills already existed. I haven't improved. Yes, I improve all the time, right? But those fundamental skills haven't like physically improved that much. But because my mental game has gone up so high, all of a sudden, all these skills that I've been building for 20 years, all of a sudden are on display. And it's like, whoa, where did all this stuff come from? But it's all because of this. Exactly. Exactly. Because it's, it's a, just a weird way in which when you are not in a good place mentally, or, you know, your psychology around the game isn't good, all of a sudden, all these things that you are capable of, you start to tell yourself that you're not and that and that you can't do it, right? And that I've never been a good player, right? Like all these kind of mm -hmm. things. And then that just translates down to the feet, right? But like you said, it's like you have the tools are all there. It's just kind of unlocking them. And the mentality becomes part of how you actually do that. And then you're just doing those things because you are a good footballer. 
you're just doing those things because kind of your your mind has allowed you and, and told you that you're good enough to go and do those. So it's yeah, it's it's important. Like mm -hmm. it, it's maybe undervalued, but it's hopefully as it's talked about more and more, it becomes that much more important for players to to recognize. Mm -hmm. So we wrap up we wrap up Spain, and you know again maybe that was kind of a huge roadblock to overcome and adversity to overcome is, you know, the plan kind of, let me see if I can figure out a way to stay in and around Europe or, or what's kind of the mindset from that perspective. So I came back to the U S and my first move was, okay, what are my options as far as playing goes? And there weren't very many because Australia at that time wasn't on my mind. I had, I was without an agent. I was kind of all over the place basically. And so what I decided to do was I said, I'm going to move back to my college town. I'm going to volunteer assistant coach, but I had an agreement with my college coach that I could train with the team. So I could get training five days a week. I could use all of the pro facilities, use their recovery machines, use their whatever. Like I was able to do that because I was faculty technically. And so I spent basically that entire season with the team. I was working two, three other jobs as well on top of that to try and make money to live and, you know, work and pay rent and all that stuff. And then, so it was, it was literally like train on my own early, early, early morning, go to work for eight hours or whatever, come back, go to training with the college team times five, Monday through Friday on the weekends, I worked at a winery. So I was like serving wine in the mornings and making money there and doing whatever. And so that repeated for like five or six months. I was totally out of contract. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was like, I'm going to stay fit because I'm going to make this work at the same time. As I spoke about before, network, 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 network talking to as many people as I possibly could. And I started talking to uh, the one pro sports management OPSM, who I now have been working with for several years. And they were like, kind of, and, and rightly so, to be fair to them, they were like, we just don't know how to help you because you don't really have anything on your resume other than the college stuff. And at that time, NISA was just about to be announced. And so yeah. I was like, what, what do I do? Okay. I'm going to go to open tryouts. Yes. I was a, this is, this is the whole like paradigm of college to pro is like, you go from senior captain awards up the Yazoo, whatever, big fish, small pond, you go to an open tryout. And all of a sudden you're around guys who are also big fishes in a small pond. And it's yeah. like, you get to that open tryout and it's like ego has to go out the window. Like there's no such thing because you are in a completely different stratosphere as far as, you know, all that stuff goes. So I went to the Los Angeles force LA force open tryout in the summer of 2019. I show up, there's, you know, 200 other guys there. The team had already been picked. So they only had maybe one or two spots left. And I kind of went down, I stayed with a friend who lived in LA from college. So I, you know, I basically just paid entrance and a flight. So I was like, okay, let's, let's just try to make this work. So I go there, I get invited back, I get invited back, I get invited back. I get signed for LA force. So I play the inaugural season of NISA in, in LA. And that was my entrance sort of into professional football as, as a, in the national independent soccer association. And that's what I mean by adapting to the time, right? Like NISA didn't exist when I graduated. So you have to wait a year and then train with your college, train with my college team, did what I had to do, network, whatever. I go to this open trial and I know a lot of guys are like open trials are a waste of money. They're whatever, whatever. Yeah. But if they're your only bloody option, yes. you got to take it if you can. <laughs> Yes. And so it's like that, you know, again, like people always say, you know, it's, it's one of those things. And I, I recently connected a, a buddy of mine who uh, connect, we, he came to Michigan stars last year when I was there, he, he was only a trialist for a week and I connected him with, and, and a lot of guys say like, Oh, connect me with, you know, Australia. I want to go play. Yep. I've now connected two people who I trust and who are, you know, good people. 
down to Australia. One of them is playing for Sorrento down in Perth. And another okay. guy who I connected with some Australia people is, uh, is playing in Northern Sydney for an NPL one team there. And so it's like, those are two examples of guys who went, Hey, there's not really any other options for me. How do I adapt? Boom. Okay. Connection. This guy trusts me. We can, we can go do that thing in the same way that I said, okay, I'm not above an open tryout. Yeah. There were guys there that if you had seen them, you would have been like, mm, like, do you, I, I don't think you should play soccer anymore, homie. Like that is may, maybe you should stop now. Like this is not your sport, yep. but that's what you get at open tryout. Despite all those external factors, again, as I said before, you're the master of what you can control. So I went out and I balled out and I ended up getting signed for the club. And that was like, that was it. So that, that was my first season. Man, there's so much to unpack there, but I love the first thing that just comes to mind for me is like, th these are some of, I love all the episodes I do, but these are some of the ones that I love because it's like that time where you speak about that time when you came back to Whitman, like that's, I think what it looks like for so many pros. It's like, these are the grinders, right? Because I think people expect, all right, I'm going to go and become professional and I'm going to get to just play all the time. And really what it looks like sometimes in the beginning is you're working eight hours a day, plus maybe you're coaching a team, plus maybe you're trying to fit in your own training and you're just storing away as much cash as possible. You're not trying to spend it on anything because you know you need cash for flights and open tryouts and things like that. Like, you know, it's just going into these endeavors that right. are, are more so just gambles, right? Like other people are saving for house, car, vacations, whatever. And it's like, I just need enough cash so that if somebody in, you know, Europe calls me or somebody across the country calls me, I can get on a plane and have my boots with me and, you know, be on a field in, in two days notice. Um, and like, that's so important. And you also spoke to the, the great point as well that, you know, sure, you might consider open tryouts to be a scam. Yes, there's, you know, hundreds of players there. And does do open tryouts exist anywhere else in the world? No, but like, you know, leave it to America to try and <laughs> privatize something and make the dream, you know, behind a, a paywall, right? But that's just the way we do it. And like you said, if you have of no course. options, you have no options. You can either sit at home and talk about how open tryouts are a scam, or you can go and put yourself out there and see what might come of that. So it's, it's the perfect advice when it comes to open tryouts, I think. hundred percent. And, 100%. And, that's it. Yeah. yeah. That season LA4, so how did it wind up kind of going for you? You know, you have all of this backstory just to get to that moment, then you sign and and what's the emotion like when signing and what's the season like thereafter? So the emotion was super excited. I was signing my first pro contract although i guess in spain you could have said pro but because i wasn't there for a whole season it was just like i don't consider that really like a pro experience even though whatever call it whatever you want but first professional getting paid to play was in la and for me that was like wow okay cool but again as i spoke about before process for me was the most important thing so i was like okay now that i'm here I always heard the hardest thing is not to get the contract, it's to stay a professional player. And so how do I continue to get, excuse me, paid for what I want to do? And that season, I will say, was even more mentally difficult than Spain. Because mm. LA, we were living in Los Angeles. We The setup there, and again, right, wrong, or indifferent, the club is set up in a way that is... Uh, we, we, we had like 12 guys in a five bedroom house. We had, there was a lot of guys on the team at that time who really loved to party super, 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 super late in the night. And because guys had other jobs, we trained in the evening. And so they could train in the evening, go out and party, bring girls back to the house until 4am in the morning, 5am sleep until the afternoon and then repeat. And for me, that was a huge, complete change in the way that I conceptualized what being a pro was, because these were guys from all over the world. And again, this isn't like a, this isn't a point at LA force. This isn't a point at anybody. It's just to say that different people are pros in different ways, just as much as I'm different from you as a person. It all yeah. depends on how they 
what cultures they come from, where, you know, what, what's okay, what's acceptable, all this stuff and what your body can handle. Right. Like I'm, I, I can't, I, I don't think I've had more than three drinks at one time in my entire life. Like I've never been drunk in my life ever. And that's just a, like, it's just one of those things, right? Some guys can go out on a bender the night before a game and score a hat trick the next day. And it's just like, yeah. what? That doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? Like it just, people are different. Yeah. And so I was exposed to all these things, but at the same time, it's like, I had to deal with, okay, ha- again, what are the things I can control? I can't control who my roommate is. I had four different roommates in the span of six months. All, and we were living in the, you know, a closet sized room with a bunk bed kind of thing. Yep. So different people in and around, we had chicks at the house who, who know, there's all sorts of terms uh, yeah, we can use yeah. for those types I'm picking of people. Up what you, we have terms. you understand. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So they were around, my room was always locked because no one was allowed in there. Cause it was like, I'm in bed at 10 o'clock and I'm waking up early and because I know that the situation here is not great, I'm going to go train in the morning. I'm going to do my own thing. All and I and I literally switched my sleeping habits. So I slept. I did what's called like biphasal sleeping. So I slept. I went and trained from seven to like ten in the morning, either at the gym or technical stuff. Come home, eat breakfast, and I'd sleep from like eleven to three or four. Train from six to eight with the team be up until God knows what hour because, you know, I tried, I literally would have earplugs, sound canceling headphones on. And then I would try to sleep while they were like raging in the next room. So I'd get a little bit of sleep during the nighttime. And then I'd repeat that every day. So I was sleeping like, you know, five hours in between each of these training sessions. And there were some really, we had a long story short, there was a very, very, uh, unethical situation that went down at the house that I stood up for. And I said, Hey, this isn't okay. And the guys who thought it was okay, completely like blasted me on social media. I got iced out of the team, like all this stuff, right? Right, wrong or indifferent. It was a learning experience. I don't, I don't like have any emotions towards it now, but those things happen in social groups in football and stuff like that. And so not only am I trying to perform on the pitch, we ended up uh, winning the championship that year, I believe. But it was like, I hardly got any playing time because I was getting socially iced out. There was all these you know, things happening, whatever, whatever. And so as a first experience, I was like, I am doing everything I possibly can to stay in my lane and to, and to control the things I can control. And what the lessons I learned in that experience, I I am so thankful for because moving into other situations became child's play for me. I was like, I can handle anything after I handle this. It's so true. It's like you have those experiences where in the moment you, you feel like wh- your head is spinning, right? You're like, what is going on here? I, I don't understand. But then after you look back at them and you're almost grateful for them because they made you so (laughs) invincible towards anything going forward. Like I've spoken to it before, but, and you probably have run into players who have come across like this team as well. I played uh, for a team in Darmstadt in Germany. And like the experience that I had there was like, just at, at times, you know, you're waking up from one day to the next and you're like, what is going on here in this club right now? Um, but then, you know, you look at it later on and you, you have all these things happen and players will come up to you and be like, isn't this crazy? Like, isn't it? And you're like, honestly, it's, you know, it is what it is. I've experienced way worse in the past. So right now it's, it's pretty much, it's pretty much child's play right now. And, And this is, I wanted to ask you about this because as, as someone from the outside looking in, I think there's so many things about Nisa that look amazing like you know there's the excellent social media presence and it looks like there's you know i know some players that play there there's there's players there there's ballers that are in this league i i can see that for sure but it also seems like sometimes behind the scenes there's things that go on that are very crazy that maybe don't happen as much in another league right where like teams are in the league and then they're out within a year and then like they're playing half the season and then they're out and and 
you know, I don't want to put you in any kind of jeopardy with, I obviously know that you're, you're playing in that league, but can you maybe put into just context a little bit, kind of what, what life is like in NISA or what the kind of situation surrounding NISA is? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's going to completely depend on the club. I mean, I, and I, and I would say this regardless of whether I was signed or on trial for flower city, we have a 17,000 seat stadium that we get to train in every day. We have an indoor turf field we can train on and use for rehab. We have a weight room, we have a cardio, we have ice baths, we have showers. Like we have our own locker room. Like this is by far bar none, probably the best pro situation in Nisa. And I would argue probably better than some USL setups. And mm, yeah. were, we, we were bottom of the league last year. And for the, you know, that, and that was like, it's not going to be that way this year. I can promise you that it'll be sick. It's going to be awesome. Uh, <laughs> however, and that, that I would say that if I was a trialist, just as much as I would, I was signing just as much as I was a coach at the club. So you have that. And then you have clubs who are training at a local field. That's not even their home field. They play yeah. their home games at a local community college. They live in team housing. That's absolute, as I described before, is yeah. totally. And 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 it's not just like I'm not trying to make a dig at any particular team. It's just like the disparity between the most like pro setup and the least pro setup. Given that they're all considered professional teams, is massive. Is massive. And so you just have to be able to say, at the the question that I think should go through a lot of people's head is like okay, what am I willing to do for my dream to become a reality? And two, at what cost? So am I, am I willing, uh, how are we with uh, swearing on the podcast? <laughs> Let her rip. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So are you, are you willing to live in shit situation? Are you, li are you literally in the dumps? Yep. And then able to be on a good team? Because you have teams like LA, we were all living in shit situation but then the team won the championship and it's like, what? That makes yeah. no sense. Cause you see on documentaries, you see, okay, man city has the absolute best facilities. They have the money to pay the best players. And so obviously they're going to win the league. That's just if a, then B there you go. But in Nisa, it's like, it's not really how it works that way. And so sometimes you have, it's all going to depend on personnel. So I think kind of to get roundabout way back to your question, Nisa is a fantastic level for uh, players just in general, and it's constantly improving. Since 2019, when I was at LA, the, the level has improved dramatically since then. So the level is very, very much, in my opinion, on par with USL, one at least. And some of those, I mean, we saw in preseason, not that preseason games are like an indicator of anything, but we saw Nisa teams beating USL championship teams in, in preseason. So it's like... Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Like that's we're, we're established as a league for sure. We we meaning Nisa, and so now it's just a matter of building. How do you build a West Coast conference that's sustainable? And for me, I think the biggest thing that is going to have to happen moving forward is the ownership of the league is just going to have to be really diligent about vetting the teams that want to enter. And so mm. ideally, it's a situation where a club who's been an established NPSL or UPSL team for 10 years or whatever says, Hey, we're in the national finals every year. We're in, you know, the national tournament every year. And we want to create a NISA team. Here's our backing. We've got ownership. We've got sponsors. We've got X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And now you can enter. And all of a sudden, at least in my opinion, Obviously, I, I'm not on any board or anything of NISA, but my hope would be that NISA would actually be a space where you could see a semi-pro to UPSL, NPSL to NISA is like there's actually a way to jump that ladder. Because, for instance, like Flower City, we have a partner team in Rochester that are like the best UPSL team in Rochester that are our partner club. And so there's going to be players during the season that will probably jump up and train with us. And then maybe, you know, guys who aren't playing as much will go play with the UPSL team. And so it's like, yeah. how do you create those environments where, you know, NISA as an independent association that isn't owned by MLS or USL, how can they continue to build and move forward? And so I have, 
I, I know despite all the craziness that happens in the league, I have faith. I hope that it goes forward. Um, but again, we just have to continue to build that reputation of those clubs that are in here. No, because I think in like in theory, when it was initially kind of presented, it was something that was really exciting for those of us who, you know, love the game and love kind of the model of, of where it is in the rest of the world, right? Because it was, the idea was kind of like, let's create this independent association, like not governed by the same, you know, principles that kind of MLS and USL abide by where, you know, everyone stays at their level. And the only way, you know, the only way a St. Louis becomes an MLS team is if they pay the, you know, whatever the buy-in fee is to get into the league, right? Like the idea behind NISA was let's kind of create our own system where we can have maybe promotion relegation. We can start to build those levels, build the pyramid the way that it is elsewhere. So it's, you know, when you see that vision, like it's something that I can see how people get really excited about it, but then just, you know, that's how I had the curiosity about it. Cause you know, you see just, you know, I think even is your team going to be flower city union this year, or is it like salt city? Cause I saw there was something about like the combination between, you know, Rochester and Syracuse. Like I know Cal United has been like a great team that seems like for the, in the past couple of years and now they're not in the league. So sometimes it just, you see things and obviously as someone who's not in the league and seeing it day to day, it's hard for us to understand, you know, some of the things that go on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So I guess the first question would be, we're, we're like city union and then we'll play some home games in Rochester, some home games in Syracuse because they combined right. ownership and it's become kind of a thing because funding for Syracuse last year, I guess, was kind of a mess and they weren't able to pay players or something happened there. I, I wasn't on the team, so I have no idea. But combined ownership, now we're good on finances and all that stuff. So things like that will happen. That being said, from a day-to-day -day perspective, if you were to ask any of the guys that are currently on the team or anybody who's trialed the experience at city union right now, flower city union, salt city union has been nothing but professional. You know, we come in every day, we have all the stuff prepared for us, ready to go. Coaching staff's incredible. Administrative stuff has been great this year. And you know, it's, it's set, you, you set the standard. And so we come in and we say, yeah, okay, we're being treated as pros. We're going to treat the organization as pros. We're going to treat the league as pros. And we're going to come at this from a really professional standpoint. And I think as you continue to build those things, I think that will that will continue to move forward. Cal United is a weird one. I haven't heard much on their end. I know they were obviously very good in the last couple of years, as you said. But as far as their situation, I've never trialed there. I don't know anyone in the organization. So I I couldn't speak to that. Yeah. No, it, it's, it, you bring up an important point there. And I think it almost ties back into a little bit of what you were speaking about, maybe in your college mindset in that in those earlier, maybe stages in a lot of players careers, you know, now you're in a professional environment, right? But those earlier stages where maybe you're in the college or semi pro uh, environment where your goals are different, maybe than others around you, you have to have just a different mm -hmm. kind of approach to the game. Um, cause I know it's something, you know, that I've spoken to players about, like when they're kind of first trying to break into the game, maybe they're playing like, you know, fifth division, sixth division in Germany, over legal level, something like that, where there's some players that are going to have that aspiration to go and play pro. And there's some that like, I'm happy here and, and I'm, I go and I work and I play, you know, a couple nights a week and this is where I'm at. And it sounds like you've had different experiences in your career where maybe like your goals, your ambitions, your aspirations, and then also how you approach your day to day is different than sometimes the environment, you know, that's around you, right? Whether it be LA force or whether it be, you know, Spain when lots of different things are happening. Um, it seems like that's just something maybe you've built that through like the psychology piece of it. It's like, I know where I'm going and this is exactly how I'm going to get there day in and day out, regardless of what the environment is like around me. Is that probably fair to say? Very much so. That's been my attitude since I was very young. Mm. And then if we talk to a little bit about like the YouTube side of it, right. And documenting your journey and kind of posting on social media as well. Like when did that sort of start for you along this journey? As we talked about, I know we kind of spoke to Australia a little bit, um, but maybe it was like that the origination of it or, or when did that kind of become part of part of your uh, journey? 
Yeah. So YouTube to me was always kind of my platform of choice from a social media perspective. I thought it was such an awesome thing that people could make videos. And I was an avid user of YouTube before starting my channel. And I think for me, that was a really key indicator of, of like, okay, if I'm going to make a side well, it's now become a full-time job, but if I'm going to create this completely other aspect of my life, why not pick a platform that I'm super comfortable with already? I know the algorithm pretty well. I know, you know what's popular on YouTube. I know what I watch. And so God knows there's probably a million other guys like me who are curious about the same stuff in soccer and yeah. in football. And so when I got to Australia, so the end of the season in 2019, Christmas happened, and then I flew to Australia January 6th or 7th, I think, of 2020. And we all know how 2020 started off. And so I was in Australia. Australia completely shut down, which meant I actually still got a whole season in. I was able to play for a year and a half down there before I got injured, and it was a, it was a beautiful experience. So I actually got really lucky just with timing of going down there. And when the when the lockdown started to happen, we in Australia and Perth, we only had eight weeks of lockdown total from February, February and March. We had some night series and then it shut down. So as soon as night series final was over, it was like all of a sudden eight weeks of nothing because the virus had hit and all that stuff. Yeah. And so I was, we were trained, me and my roommate were, who's another American guy, we were training a bunch. It was just the two of us, obviously, because we couldn't socialize with anyone else, all this stuff. And I was like, man, like I've, I've kind of always had this thing in my head. Like I really want to show this journey of being sort of a lower level pro player. And, you know, I'm not playing at championship right now. Yes. I believe I'm at the level, but like, I'm not, I'm not playing at pro. I'm not playing at this, you know, crazy high level. So this is probably the majority of players out there in the world who are pros. They're lower level guys who are in yep. the, the national premier league in Australia. They're in NISA, they're in USL one, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, like, and I love football boots. So I was like, why not share all those things and mindset and all these things? Why can't I share all that stuff? And so I started just filming like a crazy person in that lockdown. Cause I was like, there's nothing else to do. We were getting yeah. paid still which was amazing. The club took care of us. But like, I, I was like, what the hell else am I going to do with my time? You know, like there's no, yeah. so, okay, might as well start this thing. Got to start my side hustle, start to make money from it, start to build. And so that's kind of how it started. That's, that's awesome. And it's funny how you hear so many different ideas that kind of spark from that COVID time, right? Like even for me, it's the same way this podcast kind of sparked from, I was supposed to go back to Germany my flight was in March. And obviously, as we know, like, I, th I think March was really the month um, where everything just kind of kicked off. And I remember like starting the week thinking I was going to Germany. And then by the end of the week, like, no college sports were playing. And I was like, mm, I feel like I see the writing on the wall, and, and this might not be the best move. And then, you know, fast forward a month or two, and I'm doing a podcast. And here I am three years later, still doing it. So it's, it's funny how COVID inspires totally. me, things like that. Um, and you mentioned the side hustle piece of that, like, you know, you don't have to talk about numbers or anything like that, but can you just speak to it and provide context for players? Like the majority of players, I imagine that you have come across, whether they do something like this, whether they have their own kind of social platform or whether they just, you know, they go do coaching on the side or they maybe go have another job. Like that's kind of what a lot of players have to do in, in these types of levels, right? When it comes to football, because you're not making hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars a year. No, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's one of those things. It's a, it's like, it can be, it can be one of two things. I, I would say for me, it was a question of, is this a means to an end or is this going to be an opportunity for me to build what my future self wants to do? Mm. And I took the second route because I said, what do I want to do later in life? I want to build an elite training center and I want to build this environment where players can come on the off season and we have a limited number of spots and there's a camp that goes on and we train pros and we do this stuff. We talk about, you know, I, and on the side, I can do my little boot thing because I love it and I'm obsessed with them and they're fun, but I can help these young players develop and, and get the mindset straight and get the physical stuff. And so what's going to be 
what's going to be that next thing, that next best, best thing that one is going to provide a little bit of extra side cash and two is going to prepare me and build network. It's going to build relationships with brands. It's going to build all these things. Oh, cool. Yeah. YouTube channel. And I get to be creative because I get to edit and film videos. So that's cool too. Yeah. It does it feel like, what does it feel like with your, your relationship with that compared to the actual game itself and your training and everything? Like, does it sometimes feel like it's a nice little escape? Like, okay, I can, you know, kind of take football to the side for a second. I can focus on some editing and be like a little bit in a different creative space, or does it ever feel like it kind of takes away from sometimes your training and, and your, your focus to the game? Like what's kind of the balance of both in your life right now? Yeah, absolutely. Right now it's very heavy in preseason just because the physical load and the load, like the team load, as, as we say, like team bonding activities, all that stuff, that's going to take precedence. Uh, yeah. But again, my off season wasn't like that. And so I had time. I could film every single session I played in extra content. For me, when I'm playing and I decide to film a session, it's simply, okay, there are moments like split seconds where I can be like, oh, this angle would look cool. Okay, I'll put my camera there and film, whatever. But for the most part, for my training sessions, my training sessions are football specific that I just happen to be filming. And then the boot content, the mindset content, the daily vlog stuff, that can be way more creative and more interesting and I can, you know, really get into the nitty gritty and that stuff totally takes my mind away from the actual like playing football stuff right now. And so that I, I would say I'm pretty good at doing the kind of compartmentalization. There are times when it crosses over, but those times are very few and far between. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And maybe a good place for us to kind of wrap here. You know, I appreciate you taking the time for sure. Um, is maybe if you could speak to a little bit maybe kind of any goals, dreams that you have kind of in that football lane, like where kind of maybe do you see yourself heading? Um, even if it's just simply as this is what my next season, I think I want to look like and I want to accomplish here. Um, and then maybe too on the, on the creative side as well with the channel, with all those types of things, what are some of the goals you have in each of those buckets? Sure. So I'd say for this year, my goal is to get, I have some goal and assists that I'd like to rack up. I'd like to be an established leader on the team as somebody who was here last year and help young kids who are on the team, first year pros really get established with their playing style and their, their ability to network and stuff and help in that way. So just be an overall team player, I think is, is my biggest thing. Obviously, you know, I have personal goals I want to accomplish from a competitive standpoint, but I think as well, I have an opportunity here to be a, a pretty, a pretty big voice and leader on the, on the pitch and in the locker room. And I think that's going to be a really important piece for me um, from a footballing perspective. And, and as well, I, I love it here. I, Rochester's awesome. Mm -hmm. I know the club's growing, the club's getting better. We're doing tons of community outreach. So for me, my focus is here right now. And then we can kind of decide later on yeah. what the, what the next step looks like if, if we're there. Um, I will, I will definitely back, be back playing in Australia at some point again, given Ooh, okay. that my, my wife is from there. So I, I will be back at some point, which will be cool. Um, and then from the YouTube perspective, my, my goal is 50,000 subscribers by the end of the year. That's kind of my, that's kind of my big goal. That's just a numerical thing, but I've been on a cadence of about two video. Well, exactly two videos. We're now at three, but two videos a week, every week for the last two and a half years. So it's been, wow a lot of content and I want to continue building on that stuff, creating, you know, better, better content, higher quality content. And uh, just to continue to create environments where I can start to interact with viewers more, because I think that creates longer lasting relationships that really kind of dig in. And not only from a financial perspective, that's your future customer, but also mm -hmm. those are people who, are going to be much more deeply impacted by the things that you're trying to do longer term. So those are kind of like for the, for the 2023 season, for both of those aspects of my life, those are kind of the, those are kind of the two big ones. Yeah. And if people want to go and, and follow your journey and see some of the content that you are out there kind of publishing for people, should they just be searching your name on YouTube? What's kind of, if we want to direct some people to, uh, to where they should go and follow you. 
Absolutely. So YouTube's a great one. Noah Cavanaugh, you can type it into Google and I, I'm like the whole first page of the Google search is, <laughs> is all of my platforms on Instagram and my website and stuff. So that's a, uh, that's a pretty easy one. And then uh, Instagram, I do like behind the scenes and, uh, but yeah, YouTube's kind of the biggest one is, is probably the way to go. Awesome. Well, you heard him, people. Uh, make sure to go and check out. I've seen a ton of your videos, and it's it is super quality content. Whether it be for training, whether it be for mindset stuff, whether it just be to kind of see what it's like to be a pro and and give you some insight, which I think is something that's so cool about social media. That you know, I think I can speak to myself. I don't even know. Probably for both of us, like when we were kind of coming up, I don't know if there was really anything like that. Like you don't really get to see what it's actually like in the day to day of being a pro. So it's it's really cool, I think, for young players to actually kind of know a little bit what they're going into before they even venture out into it. Totally, totally. No, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it, and, uh, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, so that about does it for the Noah Cavanaugh episode this week. I'm going to have all of his links down below. Uh, his different pages. I would definitely encourage you to check it out. There's ton, there's tons of stuff there for anybody interested in football. Whether it's you want some more kind of behind the scenes stuff, some more day in the life stuff. What's a professional footballer like? If you want training videos, tips, things like that. If you want more kind of fun stuff and you want to learn about football boots and or maybe be a little bit more informed before you make your next purchase, and there's definitely a spot for that too. Uh, I want to thank Noah so much for taking the time out of his schedule, you know, as he's in season right now, to come on and, and share his story. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank all you guys out there for being patient the last couple of weeks uh, as we're getting, you know, back up and running with this episode. So thank you so much. I'll catch you guys next week. Peace. Peace.